so unit five was about genetics and heredity. And with that, you would pull in um, mitosis and meiosis. And there's some key events that you should be familiar with in meiosis. Um, and so we'll try to make sure that we point those out. So this is what, um, remember this portion here, this is their essential knowledge pieces. They want you to know heredity provides um, for continuity of life and then explain how meiosis results in the transmission of chromosomes. So you're specifically, when you're saying explain, you're looking at how it's transmitting chromosomes from one generation to the next. And, um, and so by moving the chromosomes through a series of phases, and you have two rounds of phases, um, the chromosomes are paired up, sorted, segregated into four haploid who just joined us? Joey. Okay. Um, so then comparing mitosis and meiosis, they have similar phases. They're both going through that paired sort segregate component. Um, the difference is that like meiosis is going to go through it twice and it's gonna work with homologs. So this is sorting mom and dads separately. Whereas mitosis only goes through it once and it's sorting the whole set all together. And mitosis is gonna make identical copies. Remember these are gonna call, be called somatic cells, body cells. And meiosis is making haploid uh, gametes, the sex cells. And these will all be genetically different than the original cell. So some differences and similarities. And then I see this question come up a lot um, in FRQs. So the basic idea is how do we get genetic diversity through meiosis? So there's three components you wanna talk about and then there are specific places these occur, right? So in prophase, you have homologs coming together, dads and moms, and there's crossing over occurring. So where moms do, first of all, do you guys see this slide? Because sometimes I accidentally grab the whiteboard. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so these two should be identical and say they're moms, and these two are identical and say they're dads. But during um, that synapsis of the tetrad, there's crossing over occurring, they call that a chiasma. And that's gonna create genetic diversity when pieces of dads get broken off and get reattached to moms. So you should be well familiar with prophase one and crossing over. You don't really have to know anything else that's happening in prophase. Independent assortment is happening during meiosis. And it's the fact that in the cells will, or the chromosomes will line up independent of each other during metaphase one. So um, moms aren't gonna always be on the left and dads on the right. You're not gonna get all the dominance on the left and all the um, recessives on the right, but it's gonna be a flip of the coin every time. You're gonna get one or the other. So independent assortment makes it so that each of the daughter cells will have a different set of chromosomes. And then fertilization, random fertilization, any male, egg or sperm, sorry, could fertilize any female egg. And so if he has all these different sperm and she has all these different eggs, there's, you know, 16 different combinations that could occur in this particular example. So you want to be able to talk about all three of those as they relate to genetic diversity or variation. Um, looking at how this shows common descent. So there is some evolution, remember, that trickles through all of the units. The fact that all organisms share DNA and RNA, and they're made up of the same components. We all have guanine, cytosine, thymine, adenine. We had to have gotten them from somewhere. So that comes from a common ancestor. The central dogma, the process of making DNA into RNA into proteins is the same in every organism. And that's why we can take DNA from a sheep and put it into a bacteria or a bacteria into a plant. And the new organism will express 
the inserted genes because central dogma is the same, which indicates we all come from the same original cell. Cytochrome C is a great example for evolution and um, common descent. Chromosome C is in the electron transport chain of cellular respiration. All living organisms need energy to survive. So these necessary processes are likely going to have similarities. And in this case, cytochrome C is very much the same. The genetic code of cytochrome C has been highly conserved through this entire phylogenetic tree. So all of those show um, common descent through genetics. Moving into uh, Mendel's laws and genetics. Remember he had three laws. Um, the law of dominance, he saw when he mated a purple flower with a white flower and he only got purple flowers. So there was um, some factor in the purple flower that overruled the white flower. The law of independent assortment is only seen when you have two or more traits. So when he had a pur purple, well, let's use the seeds. When he had a yellow seed with um, a smooth skin and he mated it with um, a green seed that had bumpy skin, he got all kinds of different combinations. He got smooth and round, smooth and wrinkled. He got, sorry, smooth and green, smooth and yellow, wrinkled green, wrinkled yellow. So he got all different combinations, which said those genes had to have separated from one another and gotten sorted independent of each other. The yellow didn't always move with the smooth. So independent assortment has to do with that alignment during metaphase where you got all kinds of different combinations. Segregation happens during anaphase. During anaphase one, we separate mom and dads. So at that point, you either get smooth or you get bumpy. You either get yellow or you get green. So all of those are his laws. So then using his laws, we can um, explain the inheritance of different genes. So in order to be Mendelian, it's just straightforward, um, dominant, recessive, and you can do Punnett squares to estimate um, the probability of different traits showing up. Things that are not Mendelian are not as easy to do Punnett squares with and sometimes easier to do probability laws. So like incomplete dominance, sex-linked traits, linked traits, none of those follow Mendel's rules. So you could be given a set of data to analyze and then you have to interpret or make a prediction as to how that trait is um, inherited. So these are actually simple enough to do Punnett squares with. So you would, if you're predicting it's incomplete dominance, do a Punnett square and see if your results match the data provided. Incomplete, remember, is red and white blend together to make pink. Um, sex link trait, the female carries the um, X chromosome. Um, she has two of them, so she's more likely to hide a recessive gene. Dad only has the X, one X, so whatever's on his X definitely shows. Link genes is when two genes um, are carried on a single chromosome. They act as a single gene as far as probability goes because they're connected. So um, you can do Punnett squares for any of these, but you could also use probability rules for ones that are more difficult. So just um, to review that, probability rules are product and sum. So the product rule, adding them together, is when you have, um, oops, sorry, two different possibilities that will satisfy a statement. So you're going to add the probability, probabilities of either one together. The sum rule is when you need both things to happen together. I mean the product rule. This is summing when you have either or. Product is multiplying. So that's when we need two um, things to happen both. So what's the chance of getting a big P? One half. What's the chance of getting a little P? One half. So we need both of those to occur together, so we multiply the individual chances together. So if you were to have like a tri-hybrid or a quad-hybrid, probability laws are a lot easier to work with. So deviations from Mendel's laws, like we're explaining how they're possible. So 
those are examples of things that don't follow Mendel's laws. Um, and so you would want to explain um, the inheritance patterns and how the genes interact with each other. Linked genes, remember these all occur on one chromosome. And sometimes we're asked to map a gene according to the frequencies. So remember the percent crossover that occurs is the distance they are apart on the chromosome. So sometimes we get numbers like this over here and they tell you how far apart everything is. I normally would start with the furthest ones apart and use those as bookends. This example doesn't do that, um, but they started with the X and Y and placed it there. And then they introduced the Z and that you can see the X and Z are 12 apart. So we have a question, is it 12 this side of X or is it 12 this side of X? We won't know until we look at Z's relationship to Y. So then when we see that it's only four away from Y, it couldn't possibly be way over here. And we now know it's placed on this side. So you could see something like that where you have to put them in the correct order. You could have a um, pedigree where you have to analyze it and to determine inheritance patterns. So autosomal, meaning um, it's carried on any of the first 22 chromosomes and not the 23rd. Um, usually you see equal opportunities, approximately equal between male and female. If it's dominant, every person who's affected will also have a parent affected. So they don't skip a generation. Autosomal, any of the first 22, recessive, a person with the trait may not have a parent with the trait also. So this one, the trait is hiding, so it skips a generation. We are more familiar with sex-linked recessive traits. So sex-linked, it's more common in one gender than the other. And if it's recessive, it's more common on the um, male because it only has the one X. So if it's there, it's guaranteed to show. Females are more commonly shown the sex-linked dominant trait because they have two Xs, they have two chances at having that dominant trait. You would also notice that dad, any dad that is affected, all of his daughters would be affected as well. Unless there were mutations and then you might not see that. Um, some other non-Mendelian genetics, epistasis, polygenic traits, and multiple alleles. Um, epistasis, polygenic traits, a lot easier to work with probability. Multiple alleles, you could still do a Punnett square. Um, multiple alleles, there's allele remembers different versions of a gene, and you have many different versions, not just two. So um, the most common one is the blood type. Type O is the recessive. It can be hidden if it's paired with A or B. A, B are co-dominant, so they'll both be expressed. Polygenic gets confused with multiple alleles often because they're both many genes but in this case, it's many different genes, whereas in multiple alleles, it's many forms of the same gene. So things that, like traits that come in a spectrum, you have many different skin colors, many different heights, many different body sizes. These, we have a spectrum of. So um, there is multiple genes, in this case, A, B, and C, coding for that trait. And then um, each one of them, expresses a certain amount of the gene. So like with skin color, you're talking about melanin. And so A says, put down this much melanin. And B says either to add more or not. C says to add more or not. So they're additive effects. One gene is added on top of the next. Epistasis, epi, above or upon. So one gene, not different alleles, but one gene can override another. Common examples are chinchillas, rabbits, and the Labrador Retriever. So the B gene identifies how much of the melanin to put down, how much of the pigment. If you get a dominant B, you get black. If you get a recessive B, you get chocolate. The epistatic gene, E, determines whether or not B will be expressed. So as you get a dominant gene, it doesn't add anything to the B, but it allows B to be expressed. So if you get a dominant E and any dominant B, you will get a black lab. 
If you get a dominant E and a recessive V, you'll get a chocolate lab. The epistasis comes in the, in the recessive form. So if you get recessive E's, homozygous, it doesn't matter what your B is, there will be no pigment laid down. So the, the pigment gene will not be expressed. So whether you're dominant or recessive, in all cases, you get a blonde. So that was one that um, people find confusing a lot of times. You could do a dihybrid cross with that, um, two separate monohybrid crosses and then use probability rules. Either, either of those would work. Um, this gets into one of the questions that we saw in the um, FRQs. So explaining deviations from Mendel's, we can also talk about non-nuclear genetics. So like mitosis, meiosis, those are divisions of the nucleus. So anything in the nucleus will be sorted and given to the offspring. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts do not behave in the same way. Remember the mitochondria and chloroplasts are more like bacteria. They have circular DNA. They go through binary fission and they separate independently of the cell itself. Through generations, you only receive the mitochondria from your mom. So you refer to the mitochondrial Eve. We can trace everybody's mitochondria back to the first cell. Dad's sperm, only the head penetrates the egg and releases the nucleus. Behind the head is a body. The body is where the mitochondria is found. It does not enter the egg and therefore it does not become part of the next generation. The same thing happens with chloroplast. So these are found in the ovum of the plant and not the pollen of the plant. So even in the plant species, you don't get the mitochondria or the chloroplast from the male gender. So it's only transferred through generations through the female cells. Uh, these are a couple examples of um, how the environment affects um, so you guys read in um, Survival of the Sickest, you read about how wearing sunglasses makes it so your mel melanocytes won't be expressed. So we have to experience the sunlight in order to turn on the genes in the melanocytes to make melanin, and that's how we get tan. The same thing happens, like take the Arctic animals. They're all white in the winter, and then they have color in the summer. The greater amount of daylight, like the sun, that stimulate your melanocytes, will stimulate their melanocytes and make pigment giving color to their fur. They have less daylight in the winter, less hours of sun, and so that gene doesn't get expressed in the winter and they don't make the pigment colored fur. Another common example with the AP world is how pH of soil affects the flower color of plants. So these are all the same plant, but grown in different soil samples, different pHs will produce different flower color. In the FRQ this week, they talk about how temperature affects um, the gender development of, maybe it's reptiles, I forget. It's it, it would be common to, to use a reptile or a fish in this question. Um, and like in the second, third, of the developmental stages, um, a warmer temperature will cause only the female gene to be expressed and the male gene will not be expressed. So turtles are that way too. Um, so the incubation period is very important. At different temperatures, cooler temperatures, you can let genetics take place and the male gene can be expressed. But at warmer temperatures, a female gene is expressed um, and I was trying to look into that a little bit more to see the gene regulation that caused that to happen. I think it has to do with the temperature's effect on proteins. Um, but you don't need to go into that detail for your question anyways. And I gave the example where a warmer temperature produces a female and a cooler temperature produces a male because that's the example in this week's question. Um, read the question prompts and use the data that they provide. That's something that I found reading your answers. You want to always include data or information that was provided in the reading prompt. They're giving it to you for a reason. So use that in your explanations or in your justifications. Um, 
so naturally occurring in diversity. So diversity, we already kind of talked about crossover, independent assortment, and fertilization. These I found to be really repetitive, this unit. Um, we didn't talk about mutations yet. So mutations can be good, give you a benefit, adaptation, you have a better chance of survival. They could be bad. They could cause death of the cell or of the individual, or they could have no effect whatsoever. So um, random mutations occur. We know that polymerase makes mistakes. They can be good, bad, or indifferent. That mutation is located on a chromosome. So this is all about the chromosomal theory of inheritance, where you have to link the gene to the chromosome, then follow the chromosome. Wherever the chromosome goes, the gene will go also. So if you make a mutation in a gene and the gene is located on the chromosome and the chromosome is given to the offspring, the mutation is given to the offspring as well. And then the rest of that was repeat where we talked about already, this independent assortment of chromosomes makes it so you get a mix and match of both dad and mom, and then crossover makes it so you get miscellaneous combinations. Um, but do you have any questions on any of those? or the FRQ that you've seen so far? When it says like uh, predict so-and-so, do you have to like predict what will happen and then explain why you think that will happen or do you just? It's in the question prompt. So you have to, um, you have to read the questions very carefully. They usually bold those words. And pay attention to specifically what are they asking you to predict. I didn't always get that answer when I was reading people's answers. So predict the frequency, talk about that. Predict the effect on the protein, talk about that. Like they include more information in their prompt, but try to identify specifically what prediction they want. If they want it explained, they'll give you another prompt. Justify your answer. You will get a point for each of those bold face words. Does that make sense? Yeah, but if it literally just says like in bold for the question, like predict, then you just, you just, you don't really have to explain it or anything. Right. That's kind of why. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I was really confused by the, the table in the first question, like the first question with the, um, um, like the temperature and stuff. Mm -hmm. like, I don't and it's about the ZZ and the Z. Z Z M and Z W F that one? Yes. Okay. So the data table, so the left side is temperatures. Mm -hmm. And I see that under 23, 24, 26, 28. Um, okay, so these are the crosses. The first column, you have a male and a female, a genetically male and a genetically female cross. Mm -hmm. In the third column, you have a temperature. <laughs> male or a genetic male and a temperature female. We're n we don't have the W gene, right? Mm -hmm. So they're showing you that they, the homozygous um, male cross with a genetic female in the first one and the second one is homozygous cross with homozygous. So two different crosses. And um, we see that in the, in the third column, you don't get any what a number, we don't get any females at lower temperature. Whereas when we had the genetic male and the genetic female, I did get females about 50%. These are frequencies, right? So remember frequencies are like percentages. So 0.5 would be 50%. 50% female? Um, the males, or yeah, 50% okay. female. Um, and that at higher temperatures, it didn't matter whether it was the first cross or the second cross, but I only got females and higher percentage, like a higher percentage of females. So what does the 0.08 mean? Okay, so that's my error. So plus or minus, so they're saying 50% plus or minus eight. Oh, okay. 50% plus or minus two. So the error bars. Do you remember like when we did bar graphs with error bars? Yeah. Now, those become important when you're comparing two different data pieces. If the error bars overlap each other, those two data sets are not statistically different or significantly different. 
Okay. If those two error bars do not overlap, they are significantly or statistically different. Okay. And that's where it comes into importance. So they have you graph, um, I think just three data, data points. I graphed the whole thing because I didn't really pay attention. So you would save your time by only graphing the three that they ask about. And then you were comparing your error bars. Gotcha. So like in um, one of them, I'm just gonna go, if you can kind of see my 30, I used two different colors. So my error bars for the blue are way down here. My error bars for the pink are way up here. So they did okay. not overlap. They were significantly or statistically different. Okay. In another sample um, at 35 degrees, my blue and my pink are both up here and their error bars overlapped. So there was no significant difference between the two. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm.